You're listening to the Real Estate Runway Podcast, powered by Quattro Capital, where we are all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, the recovering engineer turned multifamily investor, Chad Sutton. All right, everyone. I am very excited to introduce to you a great friend of mine and longtime colleague back when we were both engineering nerds, David Zapata. David is now a practicing IBC practitioner. That is Infinite Banking Concept. And he's going to tell us conceptually how one can use whole life insurance policies, dividend paying whole life insurance policies to divorce your dependency on the formal banking system. I cannot wait to share this with you. This is something everyone should know and understand. And I promise you, you're not going to understand all of it by listening to this episode once. So listen to it time and time again, do your research, read the book. Here we go. He is a husband and first time dad to be in June, 2021. He is an authorized IBC practitioner and wealth strategist at Factum Financial. And he is committed to sharing the value of controlling the financial function with the inner, the infinite banking concept to see if I can spit that out guys. Uh, and, and he is open to think creatively and eager to take ownership of financial destinies with his clients. David, welcome to the show. How are you doing, man? Ah, uh, thank you for having me. I'm doing great, brother. Really excited to be here. Really excited to become a dad here soon. Join the club. Yeah. Um, excited to share the message. I'm very you, passionate about it. You look very well rested. Thank you. That, that will thank change. You. That will change soon. So. Yeah, I've been, I've been doing some extra sleeping because I know it's about to change, but it's all good. That's good, man. Well, David, I know you personally. I've known you for the better part of probably, t- mm-hmm. I don't know, 12 or 13 years at this point. Yeah. But, you know, tell us kind of who you are, where you come from, how you got to where you are today. Yeah, uh, well, uh, really briefly on my background, I was born in Colombia and South America. Uh, in 2006, I got the opportunity to immigrate to the United States. And since then, I focused on education. I have an engineering background. I've been in the corporate world for the last 10 years or so. Uh, and um, recently, over the last few years, I've been, even since we met, uh, been really, really considering the combination of pursuing personal development, becoming uh, greater and greater at developing my skills. And along with that, trying to understand how my financial life, my spiritual life, my family life interacts with those things to uh, put a path from where I am to where I want to go in life. Uh, So that pursuit has led me to encounter uh, great friendships, uh, great relationships, such as such as ours but um for this particular conversation we're having one of the things that i found um an incredible tool an incredible concept that has changed my way of thinking has put it put me back at the driver's seat is the infinite banking concept which i think is something we're going to discuss today and i'm again very proud very eager to share the message with as many people as i can I love it. And I know this show is called Real Estate Runway, so you all may be confused as to why we're bringing on some sort of a banking concept. But you know, really, when you're looking at your general wealth strategy, it, it is there are different components that need to be considered in isolation. And this is one that really, really, really fits well in the lives of real estate investors, those whether you're a passive investor in you know other people's deals with, with, with investment companies like ours, or whether you're putting deals together. you know This is an interesting concept on divorcing yourself from the public banking system. And it is a, it is a paradigm shift. So you may have to listen to this episode a couple of times and then, you know, you're not going to learn this in 25 minutes. So there's going to be a reach out to David. Um, He's a wealth of information, has tools to not only talk qualitatively, but quantitatively about how this can help you. So David, let's start with the simple concept. What in the world is IBC? I, I, I like to think about it in a framework that's pretty simple. I, I put it in three basic pillars. It's, it's a combination of having a specific mindset, like you said, is a paradigm shift for where we all come from, from traditional and financial education, which is non-existent in most cases. Uh, I think there's second to that, a process in particular that we want to emulate how banks and corporations behave with respect to their capital. And then uh, as a third pillar, I would say that there's the product or the platform where we implement the process of infinite banking. So uh, to keep it pretty basic, I think that uh, when we go back to the mindset, 
the number one objective in most of these conversations for me is to help people think. Most of financial conversations go towards making people surrender their decision power, their critical thinking, and just follow advice that is aligned with the status quo. And I think from your podcast and from our recent conversations, I see you are engaged in that mission and helping people think. I don't see yes. myself as a critic or right or wrong, good or bad. I am a believer that each one of us understands what's best for ourselves and our families and our businesses and should be empowered to make these decisions from a point of strength, from a point of understanding and education. So that would be the basis for why mindset, mindset is so important, in my opinion. And based on that, uh, an idea that I'd like to share to kick off the conversation is the fact that you finance everything you buy, everything you purchase, you finance. And this is an idea that's uh, very complex, very profound, yet easily dismissed. Okay. Even if I pay cash. Even if you pay cash, you're financing. And that's, okay. that's the part of it that um, it's probably the most misleading. So what do I mean by that? Regardless of whether you're buying things that are consumer goods or services, or you're buying a rental property, an asset, you have to go through the process of exchanging value for the good and service you want to acquire. And that is going to be a transaction that can be financed multiple ways. Some of the most popular ways are using credit. Credit means that you have not gone through the process of accumulating capital. So you are willing to use someone else's capital, whether it's a credit card, a bank loan, somebody else's money. And in exchange to the use of that money now, you're willing to pay with your future income, with your future productivity, interest to that person. Therefore, the cost of that financing methodology is you are willing to pay interest to somebody outside of your system, outside of your financial system, okay? The counter, uh, what I like to call the opposite side of the same coin, which is the part that people miss is, I have, let's say, been more responsible of being like Chad, uh, and I have gone through very good mindset of I'm going to accumulate capital. Every time I receive income, I'm going to save. I'm going to pay myself first, and then I'm going to pay other people later. And after accumulated that capital, you have now the opportunity to finance things with cash. So if you were going to buy that rental property all paid up full with cash, or you're going to buy a TV with cash, people tend to be programmed with the thought that credit is bad because you are enslaved to paying interest to somebody else, but cash is better or cash is good because mm. I have no cost to my cash. And this is when mm. uh, the level of education and sophistication needs to increase to take the headwind from people's financial life. The idea is that when you pay cash, yes, in the short term, you are financing things with the capital you accumulated, but the cost of the cash is associated to the fact that you could have yourself earn interest with that capital. And that's the invitation for every single person here to take a step back and think, what am I doing with my life thinking that credit is bad, cash is good, and not understanding that perhaps they're the same coin on opposite sides. You are missing out on the opportunity to earn interest on your assets, the asset being at this point cash or capital accumulated. Mm -hmm. And I think okay. what we have what we have to put in there, let me just interject for a second. Of course. We're talking about cash and credit, right? So I think that is a paradigm shift of, of like, okay, well, let me think about this for a second. And, and let's just use round numbers. Let's say you have $10,000 in the bank mm -hmm. and you need to buy an $8,000 car, right? Mm -hmm. You can either go get a 3% interest loan from a bank and keep your 10 grand that you then go invest in the stock market and, and maybe may, or in real estate and make seven, 10%, 20%, whatever, right? So that, that that's an easy differential to see. Um, but when we're thinking about credit, most people's minds go to high interest credit cards, which arguably are bad if you're, if you're allowing yourself to pay interest on those, that's a whole nother topic, right? Yeah. But when you're talking about credit, you're really talking about like, uh, more prime rate top of loan stuff, right? Your, your low interest rate financing or any credit. Any credit for all, I mean, regardless of the size of the interest, at the end, the problem is the volume of interest that we all give up as an opportunity cost okay. to our productivity. There's more to this. Okay, let's keep going. So, so uh, let's put it in context of the average American, right? We all have 
and a spectrum where we live. Some of us are more impacted by debt. Some of us have a better financial position. But in general, if you think about the average American, we're talking about a level of categories uh, that are pretty standard for most of us. Most of us spend some portion of our income after tax in transportation, housing, living expenses. Within living expenses, you can count food, your clothing, if you have a boat, all the doodads that we like. And then the balance of that is what we call savings, right? So if you spend 90% to be generous of your money in your life, and you only have 10% for your savings, most Americans think about this equation as I need to increase the rate of return of my savings as much as possible. And therefore, they become very, very willing to take the most amount of risk in order to increase that rate of return. And the invitation from the IBC perspective is to take a step back and realize that once you go down that rabbit hole, you are pretty much dismissing all the 90% of the money that moves through you that likely represents either interest you pay when you finance a mortgage, a car payment, you put things on credit card, you're paying interest. And also, when you use cash to finance some of these things, you're missing the opportunity or earning interest on that money. And for the, the okay. absolutely, and yeah. for the average American, this, this number is fascinating to me. It's 35% almost of wow. the total value of, of interest. Every dollar, 35 cents of this 90% will go towards interest, either given up or paid. But yet we are here at this 10% trying to get at one or two or 3% maximization of return where we could be taking this headwind and finding an alternative to this methodology and recapturing the power of that interest and putting it all back to our savings, investments, however we want to find it. So, so not that's only, the perspective. Not only are most of us this, who are you know working without big depreciation and things like that, most of us working jobs, right? We're, we're working the first three months out of the year to pay the government effectively. Absolutely. And then we are then giving up an additional 35% towards interest in the form of financing, which means we are never seeing, what is that, 60% of our income? Gone. Wow. Gone. And the future Staggering. and the opportunity to earn future interest into the future, because it's also sitting on a timeline That's right. into the compound. future. Yeah. So- no wonder why we have so many issues in our society today with wealth inequality. And, and again, all these things go back to where is the mindset that most of us are living in with respect to our financial life. So yeah, the invitation, again, open your mind, consider that perhaps there's an alternative that is more powerful, more efficient, um, better suited for yourself. Uh, so that would be the part of mindset that I would use as a first pillar. Now let's move on to the process. Okay. Uh, so we have the problem. Now we're going to get into possible the solution. Okay. Absolutely. So now we're going to start thinking about, uh, let's, let's try to find examples of success with money. Okay. And when you look at the largest corporations, usually banks rank about, um, you know, top, top uh, companies around those largest corporations. And they are fantastic at managing money and making money with money. Right. What do, what do banks do? Think about this. Banks will take deposits, right? And they will put the energy of money into motion to make more money. Mm -hmm. So banks will take our deposits, pay us a minimum amount, if anything. Most banks don't pay us anything Basically at all zero. in money. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and what do they do? They put that energy to flow. They will issue a loan to the person that wants a mortgage at, 10, at 3%. When payments come back, they send that money out to the person that wants a personal loan at 6% for a car financing program. Then that money comes back and they issue an 8% remodeling home mm -hmm. loan all the way up to credit cards at 25%, right? And the more they churn that money, the more differential they get between the interest rate that they're receiving and the interest rate that they're paying in deposits. That arbitrage puts bank, banks in general at a profitability of 500, 1,000%. So they are incredible yeah. examples of success. So with that observation, the banking process, the use of money to finance our needs and the needs around those around us should be a process that we potentially could emulate, okay? And uh, most of us don't think about it that way because again, we understand the relationship with credit 
associated to paying interest, but we don't consider the fact that our capital has a cost and a value that we should put into account when we make financial decisions. Okay. Absolutely. So uh, the, second, the second part there, again, process is we need to start thinking about our financial life in terms of taking opportunity of how our capital can continue to be a source of uh, growth. And you and I have talked about this, which is taking a step back from a philosophical perspective, but what do, what do average and poor people do, unfortunately, with money? Income comes in in their income statement and then immediately flows out in expenses. And if they go into an excess spending, they have to incur liabilities with a credit card, with loans, right? But how do the, how do the wealthy think about this? Instead of immediately sending their income through expenses, they're going to flow their income through assets. And those assets will create more value that then can pay their expenses, absorb liabilities, create leverage to borrow against them. And we need to start thinking in these terms so we can, again, put a tailwind in our backs, which is a perfect segue for that third part, the platform, the product. And just to, just to yeah. interject, David, for those listening here, if, if you're trying to visualize what David is talking about with income, expenses, asset, liabilities, he's talking about the flow of money through a balance sheet. Go read the Rich Dad Cash Flow Quadrant uh, book by Robert Kiyosaki. That's exactly what that book talks about. It's like, as individual, you know, the typical American thinks about, okay, I have income and then I pay my expenses and maybe I save a little bit. That, that's not how people, that's not how the wealthy live, right? That all of their income, whatever they have comes in and goes and buys assets. And, we'll, you know, we've talked about what assets are and David will, will break into that here in a second. And then whatever money those assets make, you use to pay your expenses. It's an additional loop that is how you build wealth. So I'll leave that alone, but go ahead. Uh, and I've shared this with you, Chad, and I, I'm very open about this. This is not something that um, is theoretical or judgmental in any I mean, I'm, tech, I'm telling you that when we started working together, this was my life. You know, I had income professional coming in regardless of the amount. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, coming in and it was rent, car payment, blah, blah, blah. And the rest of the money in the checking account for those two weeks was play money. Let's go yeah. hang out. Let's have yeah. dinner. Let's have Let's a drink. Go to the right? bar. <laughs> and when I wanted to buy a round of drinks and I didn't have more money, it went on a credit card. And this happened for multiple years until I had to take a step back and think for myself, is this going to lead? Is this behavior going to lead to the results that I'm seeking, that I truly want for myself? You know, it's a very difficult conversation with yourself because you have to look at yourself in the mirror and realize that you are not consistent through your thinking, behaving, and speaking. So your integrity is out of place. And with humility, the recognition is I need to educate myself about what this actually looks like, how income flows to what assets and how I grow that. And it's a long-term process. I am engaged in that process. I know you are engaged in that process and it probably will never stop, right? But yeah. it has to start somewhere. And um, from an IPC perspective, I just wanted to bring up uh, now that third pillar the product, the implementation aspect of it. And I use the example of the banks um, to introduce this. So what do banks do then after we review that profitability cycle we talk about through using deposits? And by the way, that's just loan banking. We're not talking about deposit banking, fractional banking. Yeah. That's a conversation for another day, <laughs> right? We're talking about straight non-inflationary banking, which is not the case. It's much worse than that. But banks will take those profits and what do they do? Do they buy a 401k? Do they buy an allocation on uh, taxi for vehicles? No. Do you know what banks do? Banks will take those savings and put in on a very secure foundation where they have access to capital that by public policy, the central bank is determined tier one capital. They buy a product called bank owned life insurance, Bali. They put those uh, savings in the Bali and then they go out and whether you are in a rural city in the middle of America or you're in New York City, what do banks do? They buy the best corner buildings and offices they can find. They buy real estate. And the third thing they do is they continue to issue loans and continue to use money as energy to increase that money. So I see, to your point earlier in the podcast, the connection between IBC and real estate as strong and as foundational as any strategy that you can put in front of anyone to uh, uh, really maximize the potential of the wealth journey. 
banks do this. Corporations do this. Corporations have a product called corporate owned life insurance policies. Same thing. We're going to put uh, our savings into a product that has guarantees, lives in a tax-free environment, uh, managed professionally so we can use money in multiple ways and not just once. And this will be, again, now the connection to what does that mean for you and, and, and me at our yeah. at the you and me level, right? So the platform where this process is executed for IBC is dividend paying whole life insurance policies, usually preferably with mutual companies. And this is when uh, a lot of emotions emerge. People also have been programmed to think about this product poorly or they think about it in ways that are inaccurate. So most people hear life insurance and they think about protection. How can I protect myself against my premature death so my family or whoever uh, experiences my loss can continue to maintain their lifestyle? And that is a portion of it. But from the IBC perspective, there's much more value to extract from these products. And as a matter of fact, one of the principles we are very focused on is that as individuals and business owners, we have a greater need for financing that from protection. From a probabilistic standpoint, it is more likely that I will need money to buy primary residence, investment property, finance my children's education, weddings, trips, etc. Put uh, a name to that, right? But the probability of me dying is not zero today. It right. is 100% over time. So with that in mind, we are going to focus on an architecture of this product that allows us to maximize our ability to create a insurance vehicle that grows over time in cash value, which is the current value. Think about it as equity I've explained to you. Uh, inside a policy that eventually rises to match the death benefit they pay you at maturity. And the reason we use this vehicle, again, is because it, it is a place to warehouse money on a guarantee basis. Um, it is a place that I control from the perspective that in a contract of a life insurance policy, we become the owners. So the life insurance contract is growing from an interest basis that is guaranteed inside the policy. But now as policyholders in a mutual insurance company, we take an ownership stake. So in a bank, to go back to how banks work, when you make a deposit in a checking account, you are you are an unsecured creditor. You're lending money to the bank and that's why they're supposed to pay you interest. But when the bank makes profits, those profits are paid to the stakeholders, to the, to, usually to the stockholders of that company. Okay, You're not sharing in the profitability because you're not an owner. Yeah, I don't think my bank account has ever seen dividends from the bank. <laughs> Unless you own the stock, my friend, and you have to own yeah. a lot of it for it to be substantial, for sure. But if, if you engage in this unilateral contract where you are transferring the risk to the insurance company through these guarantees for them to grow your cash value. And you're now a part of this uh, contract with multiple people are contributing premiums to protect each other. You happen now to be a shareholder of the insurance company and the insurance companies do the same thing as bank. They take deposits in the form of premiums. They're going to issue policy loans to policyholders. They're going to invest in mortgages, and large uh, commercial real estate projects. They're going to buy treasuries from the government to have steady growth and protect the money. In a conservative basis, they're putting money to work just like banks do. And at the end of the year, what they do, they're going to see how many death benefits they had to pay that year, administrative expenses, and the profits, the difference between expenses and income is going to become the surplus dividend that they're going to distribute among the stakeholders the shareholders, which happens to be policyholders. So inside these vehicles, we get to get increased through interest and dividends. And the most important part is that because of our ownership position, we control the leverage, uh, the leverage position or the ability to take loans against this asset. So to go back to our balance sheet and think about how the rich and wealthy think about this now, through the implementation of IBC effectively, what we want to do is execute the process of banking by creating assets with our income inside a policy, insurance policy, grow cash values, and have the ability 
to collateralize, to borrow against the value inside that policy, to take money from the insurance policy and finance the purchases of assets or liabilities, how, however you're spending your money. And why, why would we do that? Why would we take credit from the insurance company? Because then we get to protect and give two jobs to our money instead of one. The money's growing uninterruptedly compounded through interest and dividends. And I also get to use it today. I don't have to wait until I'm retired to finance my life today. And I always ask my clients, tell me what happens when you take money out of a CD. Tell me what happens when you borrow money out of your 401k. Can you give your money in some of these places to jobs? And the answer is no. As soon as you take money out, you interrupt the compounding. As soon as you take a distribution from any of these vehicles. And it's a fantastic, fantastic feature that people need to start considering, thinking about shifting their mindset about their perceptions. Where did this idea, these ideas of insurance being a poor place to put money come from? And who benefits mm -hmm. to have that narrative? So really, really, really what this has created, like I, every time I hear you and others speak about this, I get a little bit smarter, right? And so everyone, if this sounds like Greek to you, listen to it again and again and again, because I promise you this is a concept you're going to want to learn. But effectively, what, what this is simulating mm -hmm. is a high yield savings account that shares in profits from the company that it's invested in and you can put a loan against it. And so I can actually spend the money off of there by taking a loan from the insurance company and not lowering my actual value in my savings account. Is that kind of how that works? I, I think that is a great way to put it. And I just will add more and more features yeah. to this. For example, the growth inside that savings account is tax-free. So you effectively mm. have taken your after-tax dollars no and put them in an environment when you'll never have to pay capital gains or income tax in the growth of that money. Mm -hmm. That money at the end of your life, we both have a probability of 100% to die. Eventually that the benefit is transferred to your beneficiary tax-free. Yeah. So think about a really large real estate portfolio that you could liquidate, put through your banking system and eventually do the transition of those assets to the next generation tax-free. What, a, what, a, what an incredible thing to do that you couldn't do with some of these other strategies alone. Okay, think about this too. Your ownership position also gives you control of how you amortize, determine the terms, determine how much interest you pay, in excess of the interest you pay the insurance company. So if you borrow money from the bank, you are not in a control position. If you stop making payments for 60 days, they're going to come to repossess that vehicle. But if you are now not only the consumer, but the owner of the financing, hmm. Think about how much more flexibility and empowerment you have for your financial life. If you finance your kids' mortgages through this vehicle and your kids lose their job, what's going to happen to the home? Nothing. They're going to get back in their feet and they're going to continue. It brings families together to strengthen from their productivity, from their productivity, a pool of money that they now control and it grows year after year so they can continue to absorb more and more of their financial needs. And again, we're talking about the ability to enhancing um, how a real estate deal looks like because now you control the financing and the mm -hmm. cost, the amortization of that cost that you put in a down payment or how you finance things, large purchases every day, a car, as simple as that. Wow. This is an incredibly powerful tool. And I, for one, have a lot of learning to go as well, but you know, it, it seems like this is really a way where you can, for once in your life, have your cake and eat it too, right? And mm -hmm. it's not, it, it's not an, it's not an expense, right? It's, you don't think about it as paying premiums. You think about it as this is a place I'm going to put all of my income, ideally, if you can, right? And then pull expenses out of it and then let it grow tax-free and with the dividends and everything like that. And you keep lather, rinse, repeating that cycle, and you wind up with all these effectively cash value policies that you can then, you're, they're liquid, you can lend against them. So you, your wealth grows in more ways than one. This is absolutely astounding. If I may just make one last comment to what you yeah. just said there, which, which I think is a very important, as a matter of fact, the recent conversation made me think of this. What if the paradigm shift here really at the end is how can I 
from from where we are today, how can I grow with this um, small amount of savings that I'm able to put together after I get income and I pay my expenses mm. to a place where you take a step back and you realize there is a significant amount of money flowing through me on a yearly basis from my productivity. What if I could use that flow of money to take advantage of the power of compounding interest and shift my system so money flows through me in a way that I manage and control my cash flows and I get to use the potential of all that money um, to grow my financial life. And I, I would steal from you. I have to. Like I, I love what you said the other day. Most people in America, unfortunately, are thinking about, by, about building a silo of water that they want to fill as much as they can so they can drain it through their retirement and hope that they don't die before it runs out of water. And you said it perfectly. I much rather build infrastructure to have a river flowing by my home where I can always tap into it and access. And I, I think that the combination again of having a foundation for your warehouse of money through the infinite banking concept mm -hmm. and having strategies where you put that money to work in something like real estate in particular is the way to build infrastructure for having rivers flow through your money and controlling that pool of money you will for, for sure need year after year in your life. That is a perfect place to conclude the episode. David, fantastic wisdom bestowment. Thank you for coming on and talking about this. Really awesome. We have Thank uh, you for having me. Yeah, it's a now, pleasure always talking to you, my friend. Absolutely. Now, what I need to do before we get into some of the last questions that we will ask you, that we ask every guest, let the guests know or the listeners know how to get in touch with you because they are going to have questions and many of them are probably sitting on the edge of their seat wondering how they can learn more about this. Absolutely. So where can they find you? Uh, well, you can reach me by email. Very easy way to contact me, David Zapata, factumfinancial.com. You can go to our website, factumfinancial.com. Uh, I think there's a link for additional uh, education services or resources that I share with you. They'll be in the show notes. Mm -hmm. I'm in social media. Um, so yeah, feel free to email me, contact me through our website. You can also schedule some time if you want to set up an initial appointment and get to know. And if you'd like to learn more, I highly recommend reading the book, Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash, the creator of the Infinite Banking Concept. Uh, but if you want, again, get more resources, reach out to me and I'd be happy to share with you um, all the tools that we have available for clients and the public. Fantastic. All right, David, a couple of fun questions. We love at Quattro Capital to know what everyone's superpower is that relates to your, as it relates to your business. What is yours? Uh, I, <laughs> I saw the question. You know, I, I am a very curious individual. I, I really enjoy um, observing how the people think, particularly because it shows me my blind spots and what I don't know that I don't know. Mm -hmm. But from really that curiosity, learning how people think, and helping them uh, see that there's always possibility. I love awakening possibility in people to connect where they want to go with a plan to how to execute on that. And I think that uh, my career, my lifestyle, being born in a different culture and absorbing this one has given me a way to look at things differently and help people think and, mm -hmm. and put plans to execute. Fantastic. And David, what is your biggest failure to date and what did it teach you? Uh, I, I, something I talk about at the beginning, I think that once I outsourced my thinking, I was in a losing position. And when I surrender my power to make financial decisions in my life to an mm -hmm. advisor that would choose what, what was best for me, I was in the loser seat. And I think recapturing that, empowering myself to humbly knowing that I needed to learn that it was going to be a journey and that I needed to take ownership, uh, I started to reverse that. I think that initially just shutting my mind and giving the keys to somebody that was going to have my best interest for me was probably uh, a lot of time and, and, and cost um, that I paid for. But thankfully, uh, it's empowered me to change that. So fantastic well david thank you so much for being on the show today this has been absolutely fantastic and for the listeners david alluded to a link where you can go and read more about this kind of a little free ebook type of thing that will be below in the show notes so have a look at that 
until next time, this has been the Real Estate Runway Podcast. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway Podcast.